Yeah, so my name is Joe Christian. Um, I work on Vespa uh, at Yahoo, and I'll talk about uh, ranking. Um, in this talk, I'll talk about ranking models, and I'll give you a high-level introduction to ranking models and how we train ranking models. And then I'll talk about large language models and how we can use these large language models, such as ChatGPT, to generate data for machine learning and training ranking models. So on a very high level, um, even if you have billions of documents, a ranking model comes down to taking query and a lot of documents and ordering these documents. Right? So that's on a very high level um, how this is done. Forget about inverted indexes, uh, BM25, Elasticsearch versus VV8 versus vectors. This is on the higher level what we want to accomplish. And to evaluate our ranking models, we can look at the order of the results that they are uh, presenting to us, for example, using human evaluation, where we can say, hey, this document number two for this query is labeled as irrelevant. It's not a good match for the query. Similarly, we can use interaction data from users interacting with our search. So we are presenting them with a ranked list of documents, and we can look at what are the users actually interacting with. And given that we have the infrastructure for actually capturing that. And then you can also use supervision using this data, either click data or annotated data, to improve our ranking model so that it gives better results. So in this case, our document number five for this query is ranked at the top, and it also has a very high relevancy for the query. This is a perfect ordering of these documents. I also want to mention when I talk about relevancy and, and whether it's relevant, in the real world, you might have multi-objective optimization problems because it might not only be about the core relevancy. I know many of you are working in e-commerce search, where there are also other um, things that influence the ranking. Uh, for example, here, I've just made up an example, but we could say something about what is the revenue of uh, if the user actually goes and buy document number five or document number three, which might, in some cases, impact the ranking, not only the textual matching. So I gave like a high level overview of what a ranking model is. And when I was younger, people were standing on stage talking about ranking models. And I was like, what, what is a ranking model? It like, sounds really fancy. So um, this is a ranking model. Right? Um, you're familiar maybe with BM25. BM25 is a classical text matching ranking function that is the default ranking function in multiple different search engines out there, including Apache Solar, Elasticsearch, and so on. And here there's a formula combining uh, different types of rank features into one score. And this ranking model doesn't have a lot of parameters, right? So BM25 itself has two parameters, and here we're combining different matches across fields. Uh, this is, by the way, some Vespa syntax. And then another different type of ranking model is uh, embedding your queries and documents into this joint embedding vector space. Atita gave a great talk about that earlier this morning. And where you use this uh, cosine similarity between the query and the document in this embedding uh, space as your ranking model, right? That's one way. Um, another example is to combine these different techniques, which is also a ranking model. Um, LightGBM is a GBT family ranking method, where, which is popular in e-commerce. XGBoost is another example. 
and cross encoders also based on transformer architectures where you're inputting both the query and the document at the same time and then predicting a score, right? So all of these are examples of ranking models, um, how you're going to rank your documents. And some of these ranking models on the underlying implementation here of these high-level functions can have a lot of parameters that we can train on, that we can adjust these parameters to adapt to our ranking case. And this is the fine print of you know, deploying ranking models to production, how you trade off effectiveness versus efficiency, how you can reduce number of candidates that you actually fully evaluate. So these are like the inner details of how you deploy a high-level ranking model to production, for example, over a billion documents. Uh, and there are different algorithms, uh, for example, for what we usually call retrievers. And retrievers, in my opinion, they are very efficient, but they can only have a minimal ranking function inside them. Because they cannot really spend a lot of compute time uh, per query document, but because they are meant to eliminate maybe billions of documents and to get rid of them very cheaply. And so for that, you typically use either approximate nearest neighbor search, which many of the vector search engines or vector search databases or all the search engines as well implement, or the weak AND algorithm, which is a way to accelerate uh, retrieval over inverted index structure. So that was the most detailed slide I had. Um, and now we go back to high level. Um, so when you want to train a ranking model, you want to have this learnable function which has parameters. It might have millions of parameters or billions of parameters or just a few parameters. But the thing is that we want to train it and we want to optimize some kind of list metric after we've done this. And all of these ranking models falls into the, what we traditionally call like learning to rank. People think about learning to rank to be about XQ boost and this and that plugin, but the whole concept of even the vectors or whatnot is, comes down to learning to rank, learning to order this list. So what do we need to train these ranking models, to adjust the parameters of this ranking model? So we need some kind of database with labeled data. And labeled data, that's where the supervision comes in, right? We are supervising the machine so that it can learn how to rank these documents. So that's the fundamental thing we need. And then we can take that data and we can train a ranking model. And after that, we're left with a ranking model. And then we can evaluate that ranking model, right? We can look at the metrics. And I included some metrics here. Looks good to me at 10. Uh, revenue at 10. Uh, NDCG at 10. And cost at 10. Right? So your mileage might vary how you actually use these metrics and before you actually ship it to production. And production means applying this ranking model to unseen queries, unlabeled data. Right? So this is the high-level overview. And how do we get to this database of labeled data? Right? There are two primary ways. We can use the click models using the user interactions on our site, or we can use human annotators and combinations of these. With using human annotators, you're asking people to rate the search results. Given a query, given a document, how good is this document for this query? So you might be grading it as an excellent or not so good, depending on the task. The pro of this is that you get quite good, high-quality labeled data. The downside is that it uses humans, and humans are expensive because they need to be paid. And the other thing is that it has some biases because we need to somehow select. Uh, because when you have a billion of documents, you cannot really show them to all the people in the world, like you need all the people in the world to judge a billion-sized collection, right? So you, you have biases when you select what data you're going to be um, exposing them to. And plus, there are human biases, like relevance is subjective. 
click models on the other way, then you can track that interaction data, people interacting with the search results to your search site, and take that data and by a click model, go from a noisy click data into a labeled data. Uh, for example, if the user search for something, then clicks on the result, and then buys the product, that's a good signal that that query is a good match for the query, right? Um, but this data also has biases, many biases. Uh, interaction data is really scarce at the tail. So here I'm trying to illustrate uh, a problem with search. So on the y-axis, you have the query frequency. Right? So that's how many times the queries are occurring in our search logs. Right? What are people searching for? And iPad is a good example. If you're running e-commerce, uh, people are, will search for iPad. Right? Uh, and there will be a lot of short queries up there. Then there's a torso, which is in the middle, like iPad charger. But at the tail, here is someone searching for a tablet with foldable keyboard with USB charger. Um, you, know, you might not see that too often right? today. So you won't have any interaction data for those type of queries. They will be brand new. They, you, you, your ranking model, it will be, it doesn't know how to treat it. The other thing is that when we are collecting interaction data by clicks, it's heavily biased towards whatever ranking model you have in production today, because that's what's delivering the results that the user are interacting with, right? And you only have this amount of real estate to actually show end users' results, so they are interacting with that data, right? So it's a heavily biased towards whatever you have in production today. So when you're deploying a new train ranking model, what you really have done is to learn how to re-rank those results that are already presented to the user, which is fine, but it's still something that you have to think about. And in Norway, we often wake up to this, uh, but cold start. What if you are hired at a company that don't have any interaction data, they don't have the logging infrastructure to do it, and you don't have the money to have annotators annotate your results, right? So where, where do you start you know, to, to actually go about and doing a ranking model? The best thing you can do is actually start with something we call zero-shot ranking or EM25. You need to start somewhere, right? But where you start will also affect the project later on because everything you're going to collect if you're gathering people together, click data, is going to be biased towards that first ranking model, right? So what if we can magically generate good quality training data? Um, and I think that's interesting. I'm personally... I'm active on Twitter. Um, I have a few hot takes. Um, so in April 2022, I wrote something I'm not that proud of anymore, but I wrote that these billion parameter language models are a pissing contest. No practical use cases. But there was a paper that caught my interest from Google Research, PromptGator. And PromptGator was generating training data using a very large language model, a language model with 136 billion parameters. And after I discovered that direction, there are also multiple other um, similar papers in parse, in parse V2, in parse Lite, and several others, which I find really interesting. So the next part of the talk, I'll talk about a high-level overview of what these models are actually doing. So one-on-one large language models introduction is that you have some prompt instructions, you have a text, you input that to a frozen large language models. For example, if you case in chat GPT, you can input, um, write me a Christmas song in the tone of Snoop Doggy Dog. And it will try to complete and give you some text on the output. That's the basic interface of these models, and they have a nice little snowflake there indicating that the model parameters are frozen. And we are all pretty amazed by ChatGPT and the power of these models, and most of these 
came from instruction fine-tuning that they actually tune them on different tasks. So generally, the language models that we can interact with today, they are much more useful than a year ago. And then it could be used for this. And this is a high-level overview of what and how we can generate uh, synthetic query data for training ranking models with, with uh, large language models. So you have a document collection, right? So that's, that's your corpus. That's usually given, right? You want to search this data, right? So your manager says, oh, I want to search the documentation. Uh, you need to build a search interface for it. OK, so I have my documents. And then we can use this magical prompt, which basically asks the large language model to generate queries for each of the documents in the collection. And this could be ChatGPT, Google Bard, open source models, whatnot. And then you have some synthetic queries for documents. And now we have labeled data, OK? So it's, it's still a bit yellow, I would say. So. And the prompting of these language models is basically casting your spell. And there are a lot of fancy words used around them, so zero shot. It means no examples is given in the prompt. One shot adds one example. A few shot are more examples. So that's one way to, and people call this that the prompt, you're stuffing things into the prompt, and they call it in context learning. But the model parameters are frozen. Nobody's learning anything. Uh, it's just attending to the input. And the input is limited, so we cannot chunk up the whole internet and put it into the prompt. Typically, it's limited in the input length because they are rather expensive to evaluate. And there's a whole field of prompt engineering these, and practicing helps. So a good analogy is to, you know, if you're asking someone to complete the task, and you can tell them the task, but they cannot email you back. So it's a good way to, to, and you can have several different prompt templates to mix things up to combining of you, how you actually synthetically generate things. And this is an instruction prompt where at the start you're saying you're a search engine relevancy expert that generates relevant queries for articles and your instructions are blah, blah, blah. And here's an article at Bernard Bustford. We will hear lots of great talks, blah, blah, blah. There's also a search engine debate at 1720 in Kessel House, where you will hear more about Vespa, Elasticsearch, Apache Solar, and more. And an example of relevant questions for this data. So this is my prompt instruction. This is my one example of what I want you to achieve. And then I could go through the Berlin Bustford site, take all the articles or documents that are there, and then ask the model to generate uh, a relevant question. And did that with uh, using ChatGPT and uh, input this article. Berlin Bestwood is the Germany's most exciting conference. I agree. Uh, it's about storing. It's about open source. And these are the questions that ChatGPT uh, generated. But we had this, right? So we had generated these queries, and we still are in yellow because the data is, is labeled. Um, but it might be smart to validate the generations that the language model is doing, and we call this consistency checking. So one simple approach for checking the consistency of the generated query, if it's, if it's a good generation or not, is to actually take that synthetic query and use traditional BM25 or whatever you have in your search system, search for that document, and see if the engine is actually returning it. If it's returning it, that means that it's a rather specific and good question. So we can say, OK, this is actually a labeled data example generated by the language model that we will keep. The other one we'll throw in the garbage bin because it might be to generate. When we started working with this, it might generate questions like, what is the article about? It doesn't make sense, right? It, you know, what is the article about? You don't want to train a model on that. Another thing that you need for training ranking models, typically, is that you need examples of 
irrelevant documents or negative examples. And a way to sample uh, irrelevant documents is basically to sample randomly among the top documents, for example, retrieved by a system using a bad retriever. Uh, it might be a um, BERT model that hasn't been trained at all for ranking, or it might be a BM25 system. It might be different ways to sample this data. So here I have this good question for a given document that is relevant, but I'm not trying to find an irrelevant document. And I find that by doing this, and document 2398 is assigned um, irrelevant. And now we have gone from our gray database up there, that data we needed to train ranking models. That was, you know, how do we get that? Now we have synthetic label data, so we can actually start training a ranking model. And, but still, you are still going to train a ranking model, and you're going to evaluate it, and you will still have looks good to me and the revenue and that, that part of, of actually deploying this to production. But the huge benefit of this approach is that invoking these large language models is quite impractical for most organizations at query time, right? Because you need to have low latency. By doing this way, you're doing everything offline, right? There is no latency requirement. You know, you only have to care about the throughput and the cost and the quality. You don't have to think about how is this hurting users in a latency perspective, which I think is, 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 a, is a good thing. So you talked about this great model, but how does it actually perform in, in practice? And this is an overview from the Promptigator uh, paper. And the beer data set, I talked about beer data set at my talk at Berlin Bisward last year, but it's a collection of multiple information retrieval data sets. So it's a diverse set of, of data. And some of them are mentioned here. There are different like, search problems. And on the relevancy, or the, when you evaluate using NGCG on these data sets, these models that generate data and train the ranking model outperforms the other models. It's not a huge surprise, but still a significant gift, uh, lift and gift, maybe. We also did a blog post we, at the Vespa team. We took this approach to improve on a data set that is part of the beer benchmark, and that is a uh, biomedical literature search related to Trek COVID, or to COVID, and the collection is called Trek COVID. And here we could evaluate different models. Uh, on the left here, uh, it's the BM25 implementation in Vespa gives you an NDCD score of 69, which is also pretty good. But using this generative model to generate synthetic data and applying that, we could actually lift the accuracy all the way to 79, which is, in my opinion, a significant lift and improvement. But it depends also on, on your domain and how much data uh, you are willing to spend on the generating the trading data and so forth. So that was the method. Uh, there are now many, many uh, information retrieval papers on using uh, large language models to augment training data. Uh, here's a very recent one from May, which I find also interesting, and it's in the same uh, area of interest that uh, we've seen lately, where they're using generative models to generate synthetic training data. So, and I think SIG ER this year is going to be full of papers using large language models to generate synthetic training. And also in the industry, we see now that companies like Spotify, Spotify is doing uh, a lot on search, on podcast search. And as I said, there's, they have interaction trade models because they have been gathering interaction data from users when they're searching for music or podcasts or podcast episodes. So, and they've trained a so-called dense model, a vector model where you can use vector search. And yeah, they also use Vespa for that, which is great. 
Uh, but what they find in this paper is that they improve the discoverability. So items that were never shown before are now uh, actually discoverable by the users, right? Because of this ranking biases problem of you training your data uh, on the interactions that have been determined by the previous production ranking model. And in the Vespa, we also found that uh, we're building a new documentation search interface for searching our documents, uh, our Vespa resources. And we actually found that we can also use the large language models to generate uh, query suggestions. So what we did was that we took all the content that we have on, on Vespa, and then we asked the large language models to generate questions for each of these documents. And then we could put that into auto-suggest mode in, in Vespa, and when you're trying to search for something, it's actually uh, suggesting these. And all these suggestions are then generated by the generative model, but we don't use it at the online phase, right? So we do that offline, put it into a Vespa index, and then at query time, we actually serve this results. So that's another uh, emerging direction. Uh, there's, there's some problems ahead as well. I, I would like to bring them up. Um, you, uh, there's uh, interesting papers on perspectives on large language models for relevancy judgments, uh, which I do uh, recommend to, to read. Uh, but there's some correlation here between uh, the machine and, and the human, but it's, it's not, it's not Perfect, but it also demonstrates that these language models could have a potential there to um, assist the humans or to generate training data. So, but in the near future, it's going to be very difficult to differentiate between what is actually generated by human and what's generating by these generative models. And this is a very recent paper where they found that if you submit things to Amazon Turk or the, the crowdsourcing solution, uh, the, where you're asking actually humans to annotate your search results, they might have been using ChatGPT for that. Right? So, it, it's, so maybe ChatGPT will evaluate your search relevance anyway. So. Yeah, and we, a part of this work, we open sourced um, several notebooks. So we used an open source model from Google to generate these questions. So that's uh, available. Uh, there's also the blog post. If you go to Blog West by AI, there's a lot of content on search and ranking. And uh, yeah, that concludes actually the talk. So I have plenty of time for, for, for questions. And I will be answering using this prompt. There is also a system prompt. I'm biased towards Vespa. Yeah, but I'll, it's um, a great upcoming debate today at 5.20, so I recommend you to come there. Uh, then you will hear more about Vespa and comparing Vespa with other technologies. So, thank you. Thank you, Joel. Do we have any questions for Joel? So you mentioned um, generating queries that were between you know, three and six um, tokens long. Have you also looked at you know, generating long, those longer tail queries to improve the relevance there? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So when you look at the... Um, when we are working, we are not working on actually customer cases, right? We are working on open research data, right? And then you have, when you evaluate, you basically only have unique queries. And most often, these are from the tail, because the, the head queries are typically handled by some different system, right? So that's also something that's important to think about. When you look at information retrieval research, they're always working on unique queries, right? And most often, it's from the tail, right? So, but in your production use case, you have to think about this when you deploy changes, right? Because if you break head queries, or if you're using the same ranking model to solve both head queries and tail queries, and you're like, oh, it's so great for tail queries, and then you break the head, right? Then people would be mad if you break the iPad case, yeah. But yeah, so I, I don't have, basically all of this research is, is working on head and tail queries, sorry. Yeah, it's a great question.
Hey, um, I'm uh, new to this domain, so sorry if this is a naive question. Uh, well, my question is, uh, typically, uh, for tail queries, uh, what I've seen uh, people do, at least at the companies I've worked at, is uh, they usually pick separate categories of queries too. So th there is one category in which uh, you actually search your things and then you return the response, but there are other categories uh, and then they blend the search results from multiple categories and present them to the user. Uh, I'm actually curious is, uh, I'm assuming blending is probably a common technique, but this is assuming no blending, uh, or, or rather the techniques that you mention here are to prevent, so that we don't have to use blending, is that accurate? Yes, yeah, so this is a great question. So in this talk, we'd cover like one problem area of search. So for example, um, you mentioned that your, maybe your inbox and combine that with some web documents and others, right? Where you blend these two together. So in that case, you know, you can improve each of the ranking of each of these components in, in the system, right? And how you actually blend those results and present to the end user is also potentially a machine learned model, right? So, so as I see it, you, you could, focus on each of these individual ranking lists, right? So if you look at any site today, there are a lot of lists. If you get into ranking, you say, oh, the suggestions is a ranked list. The items recommended to me, it's a ranked list, right? So everything is a ranked list, yeah. Uh, hi, thank hi. you for the very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, have you had any uh, challenges in terms of uh, language adaptation, uh, multilingual models, and what have you done to address those? Yeah, this, this is a great question. So, me personally, I have only worked on English uh, retrieval data sets, not looking at the uh, multilingual uh, information retrieval sets. But there is a multilingual information retrieval data set called Miracle which has many different languages and low research languages. So it would be highly interesting to actually use this method uh, to generate also in other languages. But then you're very dependent on the quality of the large language model and like, if it's actually been trained on uh, those languages. And we know that for some low resources languages, you don't find a lot of internet text about them. So generally these language models do a very poor job. Yeah, that's a great question. So. Hey, thank you for, for the great talk. Um, I, I have a question. You talked about um, BM25 using it uh, to filter out um, uh, synthetic queries that were generated by an LL LLM. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, like, um, so your, your example is good. It could be like a completely irrelevant question. But we also know that BM25 usually finds things where there's some kind of keyword match. And you could uh, imagine, like, um, long tail examples where it's just a semantic description. How do you square these two things? Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a very deep question. And as I said, um, we're trying to find something that is not relevant to the document, or to the query, right? Because we want to show the, the, the ranking model, the smaller model, an example of here's a query, here's a relevant document, here's an irrelevant document. So, so it's about the sampling of this. Uh, when we sample it like this, we're taking BM25 or some other method, and then we're randomly picking something to be represent as irrelevant, right? We have the chance of possibility that we are mislabeling it, right? So, so it's, it's largely an unsolved problem. Uh, but choosing these negatives is really important, and that's how these dense vector models actually became useful a year or two ago because people learn how to actually sample these negative examples, yeah. So I would say it's, I, I don't have a good uh, answer to that, no. no. Hi, Joe. Hey. Um, do you think uh, it would be worth uh, doing some fine-tuning on the... Because it's, it always seems like overkill to, lo to use a uh, chat GPT and other uh, uh, similar uh, models to do a very uh, specialized task, but maybe there is no point doing uh, any other way, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So 
uh, in our work, uh, when we, okay, so we compare with the Promptigator, which is a Google paper, and they used their, at the time, uh, closed source model called BARD to generate these questions, which was a huge model, 136 billion parameters, right? We, in our work, use an open source, 3 billion parameter model that we could potentially fine tune for our domain if we wanted to do that. Uh, and we outperform actually uh, the results that they were getting with a much larger model. So it's possible to do this without having to send your data to ChatGPT. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I had two questions, but the first one was just asked. Uh, the second one is, are there like use case and you gave one use case of using LLM to generate data for, for trading. As a use case, you would recommend not to use LLM where it wouldn't work. Is that maybe you try to, because I'm not very familiar with the literature, but. Um, so you're asking like, are there cases where large language models will only hurt the performance? Yeah. Yeah, there are probably a ton. Uh, especially around conversion search, if you try to that. Uh, it's totally unrelated, but I know people are working on generative AI right now, and the whole community is still struggling with deploying a simple machine learning model that takes some text and outputs a score. Right? We have the whole ML ops community and involvement around how we evaluate these models, but then at least we have a model which the tensor shape is known ahead. We know it's going to output a score. right? And so it's, it's, it might be a classifier, it might be a relevancy model, whatnot, right? But we know what the output is. With text to text, we don't know what the output is going to be, right? So it's much harder to deploy these into, into production. So, yeah. It doesn't really answer your question, but I could fill that in. <laughs> we all love statistics here, and we all love numbers. But sometimes examples give you insights that are complementary to the statistics. So I know certainly that you know, the LGTM metric, as yep. you pointed out, you say, let me look at the results and see if they're good. But you can also look at the results sometimes and see qualitatively some patterns of success and failure. So for example, one, one method we used last year in our experiments, uh, it was getting very good numbers. But when we looked at the results by eyeball, the very finely tuned eyeball, we discovered, oh, it fails whenever there are numbers involved because it doesn't have the notion of numerical similarity, um, which no one had thought about as, a, as an issue. What kinds of qualitative uh, impressions do you have of the quality of your, uh, of your techniques? Yeah, it's a deep question, but I would like to say that then there is a problem with your standard evaluation that the query set does not actually include uh, queries with numbers, right? Then you would pick it up. But anyway, I, I don't want to, you know, looks good to me. I use it all the time when I work with the Vespa documentation search. I mean, that's, that's the way we do it. You know, you start with that before you start, you know, asking others. So getting the basic right. And that's the same thing. Most of us, we are trying to attack the search problems from the head first, right? get that iPad query right, you know, before you solve this advanced tail queries, right? So you have to start somewhere. But I personally think that the thing that makes me return to a site is when it handles tail queries in a good way. And I think that searchers will expect more from you from the search implementation now that the major web search players are rolling out search experiences that users will adapt to. So they will train you on how to actually do queries, and they will come to your site, and they will expect the same, right? So, yeah. One last question. I'm in between you and lunch, so. Thank you so much for a great talk. Thank uh, you. One uh, question, obviously, the last one, because uh, the entire aspect of this talk was about the text content. But I'm more curious to know, how would you address the similar approach or try to fit this? Uh, for the other modes? 
right. images and audios and videos. Yeah, so in this case, we're using a text-to-text -text model. So we are obviously only generating the text data uh, for training, and we're only training uh, the text part. Uh, of the, but your, your ranking model might have different combinations, and also with the click data, because the click data is actually uh, then gradient-entering uh, interaction data where you have multiple different objectives or things that influence your ranking, right? Like the price, the rating, and whatnot, right? So, so that's not covered in, 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 in this way. But I do see that, you know, if you expand the prompt, for example, in e-commerce, you might instruct it in a way that, say, in your examples, here's the examples, here's the price, here's the rating, that it could attend to that information when generating the, the synthetic query.